one. Hello everyone. In this video, I can't believe it. I'm fortunate enough to sit down with one of my favorite filmmakers alive. And you know, in, in my opinion, he won't say himself a true genius, the amazing Robert Eggers. I mean, so many different films. You may recognize Robert as the director behind most recently The Northman, which came out in the last year or so. Uh, on top of that, films such as The Lighthouse and The Witch. Uh, but I've been the biggest fan of Robert's work for a while. And the fact that I somehow got him on the channel using my Irish shy talking is amazing. But Robert, thank you so much for taking the time to come on. How are you doing today, sir? Very well, thank you. No, dude, I mean, so Glad many be here. so many different things to discuss. I mean, first things first, I mean, let me ask you, what is the Robert Eggers origin story? Did you grow up watching silent French films? I mean, where, where did the love for film come from? Um, you know, uh, I think as any good American kid who was born in the 80s, like I, I grew up on Spielberg and Star Wars and, and all that kind of thing. And yeah. Um, but, uh, but I was always looking for something different and I, you know, the, and I, uh, you know, happened to find a picture of Max Shrek in a book about vampires in the elementary school library, which led me to try to track down Nosferatu. And, uh, and <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I guess I was watching silent movies as, as a kid, um, along with these other things, but it was sort of in high school when I, discovered david lynch and terry gilliam and uh you know and then that which you know led to bergman and whatever else yeah i mean man i, I sent you a message right when the northman was coming up and like i remember when i first started interviewing directors i was like i'm just gonna send every all my favorite directors an email i'll just do them all and one of them's bound to say yeah and i mean I sent you an email not thinking it would get anywhere. And somehow this was when the Northman was coming out, arguably the busiest time of your career. And not only did you take the time to reply, you also told me you appreciate my tenacity, which I was telling everyone. I was like, Robert Eggers appreciates my tenacity. Uh, but you you really couldn't have been kinder. So the fact that, you know, I've kind of managed to wear you down over time and get the chat with you means the world. So I mean, it just, just shows how cool of a guy you are, man. Uh, but no, I mean, yeah, you look at your work and, uh, something I'm curious about before we even talk about your work I, I saw a recent list you did on Sight and Sound magazine and you talked one of your favourite films being Andrei Rublev not sure if I pronounced that right by obviously Tarkovsky and you know that was really fascinating to me and I'd never seen that film before so I watched it over the last couple of days and it, it's a fantastic film I was just wondering could you tell me about your love for that film well um, I, I, I mean it, it partially it's it's a marvel because uh, I don't think a, a movie that you know that that is uh, with 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 that kind of a, a, an unconventional narrative at that scale could be made uh like without the soviet system you know yeah. and and i also understand that tarkovsky was fond of reshooting scenes so the like the this the just the the scale of doing something like that is alone is just a marvel to a filmmaker today but i think um it's you know it's this uh, very transportive hypnotic filmmaking i mean the first time i watched it i wasn't even i didn't know which one of the monks was andre rublev until like way late in the film <laughs> you know yeah. uh, because because it has the, you know it is a bit distant in the beginning but then it all builds up to uh, the last chapter of the story, which is yeah. incredibly conventionally narrative and becomes like super cathartic um, after watching, uh, you know, this this more meditative film. But um, but, you know, it, it, all, all the things that he's learned from, you know, Kurosawa and these other filmmakers that came before him just got like, you know, condensed into this really, really intense uh film that's yeah you know, one of the most visually beautiful ever and you know um yeah that's that's something <laughs> dude it's great man i mean i watched a film and i'm a sap so i just thought this was a film that was created when color didn't exist in film you know like like if it's a film before the 60s i'm like all right so it's made in 1920 or something like that and then you know the final sequence when it just changes the color was something i was really blown yeah. away by that and i i get what you're saying about and I think there's something about non-linear storytelling, telling a film within chapters, which is something that I think has kind of, it's, I don't know if it's more common now, but it's something we, we've seen a lot more. And we're a lot more used to, it, you yeah. know, seeing films told in chapters or something like that. I mean, do you take inspiration from that kind of non-linear storytelling? I think that's something you can see in your work or is that just unrelated? 
No, for sure. But I, I mean, I, I, he, you know, Tarkovsky's after something different than I'm after, and I don't pretend to be after the same yes. thing. I'm sure he'd find my films to be sensationalist and distasteful. But, um, but there's certainly, um, uh, you know, a, a lot to be learned, and you can, I mean, you can see direct literal influence on the, you know, the the Tartar raid oh. in the North. I mean, it, like it's it's you know, there's things that are certainly uh, one to one. Yeah. And I mean, it's, oh, dude, you just brought it up there. I have to ask about this. The Northman. I mean, what's it like, you know, sitting down, finally saying the film's out there, it exists, it's done a theatrical run, I can get some sleep. You've made your Viking film. I mean, how does that feel now? Can can you look back at that or do you still need a bit more time? Uh, I mean, it's, it's, I'm glad to have done it. Uh, yeah. I learned a lot and, uh, and it's definitely preparing me for the, the next thing. That's for sure. Um, be, I just, I can't, it's, it's, uh, I can't quite wrap my mind around how much I learned. Uh, and, and, you know, and in the end, thanks to streaming, uh, like it, it did well and found an audience. So that's, uh, that's great. Yeah, man. And I mean, I loved it. And I think, you know, is it true? That, did you shoot some of this in Ireland? I mean, I don't know how much you shot in Ireland, maybe some other places in the world, but did you shoot some of it in Ireland? Yeah, we shot um, most of it in, in Northern Ireland. Um, and yeah. Uh, uh you know certainly we did some we, we did some stuff in iceland but like all, all of the land of the roos was was in ireland and 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 most of everything else was there um and it, and just be, we were going to shoot more in iceland but because of covid we couldn't yeah. um and so a lot of so the farm for example that we spend most of our time in, in the icelandic farm is you know the foreground in the midground is yeah. uh, northern ireland and then the distant landscapes are is our iceland dude let me ask you this did the weather work to your favor favor because i was talking with david lowry who made the green night and he shot here in wicklow which is a county over from dublin and we go up to wicklow to hike and stuff like that and he came to ireland because ireland's known for its moody it's rain and he came and it was just so sunny and he was trying to shoot but you know the weather just wasn't working for him so i always like to ask directors that shot in ireland how, how was the weather for you the weather was was very miserable, which was just what we were looking for. So <laughs> I assumed they were all half naked with their beards and you know in their Viking gear, and you were like that, and just a jacket and hat, and you're like, okay, now now act. Yeah. So, so all around sounds sounds like a fantastic experience. But I mean, so let me ask you this: doing something like the Northman, which is obviously, I guess, the largest of your films, is that fair to say? I guess in scale, mm -hmm. it's the largest. Yeah, I mean, without yeah. a doubt. Yeah. Oh, yeah, totally. And so, I mean, when you're doing something like that, was there? Now, do you feel like you've done something like that? You maybe you wouldn't be, you know, if you did something like that, a larger scale film, you'd be more well adjusted. Because I assume I I know from other directors, it has its pros and cons. Like directors like Duncan Jones, who made you know Moon for like four million dollars. At the same time, you know, you do have a bit more freedom on a project like that. When you're doing something this large, is it hard for you not to lose your creative input, your creative control, or do you always manage to tell the story you want to tell? Uh, you know, I, it was, um, it was the first film that I made that I did not have final cut. Uh, but uh, at the same time, I was given a lot of freedom, uh, by the studio and a lot of control. And I basically got to do it my way. But, but then when the film was in post-productions, na naturally there were notes, uh, yeah. and not having, contractually having final cut put makes you know made me more nervous but i think that you know shown uh my icelandic co-writer said uh you know we're creative people and it's our job to take these notes and interpret them in a way that makes the film better and if we yeah. can't do that then we're not working hard enough and i think that that was the only approach to like getting through the studio notes in a way that we, you know, felt like it was improving the film instead of, instead of uh, detracting from um, our original intentions and straying from our original intentions. So it was, it was that, you know, that part of it was probably the hardest thing I've ever done, uh, but I'm, but I'm proud of it, you know, and, and, you know, that, you know, there is no director's cut, the version. Yeah that uh you see is is the director's cut i put some um deleted scenes on the on the on the blu-ray which i'm not i don't know how i feel about deleted scenes 
uh, as a concept, but there was some work yeah. that we had done that I was proud of that I, I thought would, would be good to have be out in the world. But like, mo you know, many of these scenes were scenes with Nicole Kidman's character. And I think that, you know, having those scenes in the film detracted from being with Alex, Alex's character and, yeah. and sort of spoiled the surprise of the big scene with him and his mother. So, um, so yeah. Dude, I mean, I absolutely loved it. Watching it in cinemas, it was my first Eggers film I got to see in cinemas. So it was an amazing experience and it was so large. Me and my friend, you know, Ryan went to see it. My friend Ryan's the biggest Viking fan ever. So, I mean, and you know, the fact that it was so historically accurate and really just a fantastic film. Was it nice to finally get sides back into your film? You know, when you're shooting with that boxy aspect ratio with the lighthouse, was were you, were you sitting there like, wait, so I can actually, I can use sides again in this film? It can be a full Well, I, I, I mean, I actually didn't like having all that extra room <laughs> <laughs> You're like, just make it, just make it a box. All right. We'll just cut yeah. everything else. Yeah. I'm used to a box. Well, listen, it's nice to be back. I mean, we all have to, you know, break frame someday, but no, let me ask you yeah. this. I mean, we look at your career. I feel like, you know, I feel like you are a director. If you wanted to, you could tell stories about regular people who live in a regular world, but instead you strike me as someone who takes those risks and makes films like, you know, two lighthouse keepers. I mean, it's one of my favorite films of all time. It's not a film that, you know, it, it's almost a film that, you know, it's not necessarily commercially successful, but you hear it and you're like, it's interesting and it kind of drags you in. Let me ask you that. Are you interested in taking risks? Is that something that just appeals to you as a storyteller? Because I think you can kind of see that in your work. Yeah, apparently I like to take risks. <laughs> yeah, is that going to stay that way? Are you going to lean more to more commercial, as commercial aspects with something like the Northman? Or do you just want to make the projects that, you know, you want to... Even, even the Northman, like, I mean... You know, even the Northman is, you know, not the most conventional way to tell a Viking story. Um, so, uh, you know, and it was a risk to to make a film at that scale without having the experience to do so. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, uh, I hope to make, you know, the, the movie I'm working on right now is in between the Northman and the Lighthouse in in, in budget. But in some ways, it's larger than the Northman in scale. In some ways, um, so uh, and and I'd love to make you know a, a a tiny a tiny movie again sometime. So we'll you know and I don't think I don't I I don't think I would ever be able to do it in a way that I had the kind of control that I would want. But I you know I, um, I don't know that there's any story that I would be interested in that would be financeable at a budget larger than the Northmen, but I would, you know, like a giant medieval battle movie, you know, Joan of Arc or something, you know, I would have appeal on that. It probably wouldn't happen, but, but it would, but after the experience of doing the Northmen, I, you know, there's, I'd be interested in theory. You still want to scratch that itch, you know, no, not, not enough battles, not enough, you know, Viking blood. Now there's some more medieval stories you want to tell. Uh, but I mean, you know, I know obviously we, we can't talk about it too much, but let me just ask you this. How excited are you to jump into Nosferatu? I mean, that must be. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a it's a dream come true. It's um very it's like been kind of emotional at times, like walking around the sets and seeing it all come together. Um, and you know, but it's scary for everybody because, um, you know, we're always trying to make the best film we can, but this one comes with an added responsibility and and pressure. Um, yeah. so, um, so that's challenging. <laughs> dude, it's, it sounds like a lovely, very peaceful time and all, but I mean, dude, the last thing you, you probably need to hear this from a 15 year old dipshit kid, but really, man, I think you're the, the perfect director too. And I really think you're going to do a great job working on that. I mean, is this, this is like the project for you. You know, I read your interviews. I mean, growing up, you were even a fan of this. I mean, is it true? You've always had a love for Nosferatu in your heart. Yeah. So, so, you know, in a weird way, it, it like, even though it's, uh, someone else's source material. It's like, you know, maybe my most personal movie yet. <laughs> we'll see. That's amazing. Did you do a theater reproduction when you were a kid of Nosferatu? Yeah, I did. I did. I directed a stage play with my friend, Ashley Kelly Tata, who's now an experimental opera director. But we, we did a stage play of Nosferatu when I was, uh, yeah, like 17. And so I, I've always, I've had various, scripts and versions of Nosferatu since since I was 17 and I'm 
now 39. So, and I'll, you know, so it's been a long time coming. Bram Stoker was Irish. So as a fellow Irish man, I think I can say, I give you the, I give you the approval. I give you the stamp and you know what, just come over and shoot it in Ireland again. Cause I missed you when you did the last one. So just shoot all, all your next films, just make them, give them some Irish edge or something and just shoot them all here. It sounds, sounds- it, we, I had a great time shooting um and and would it would love to shoot there uh, again frankly yeah uh, put, in, instead of staying in a five-star hotel i could probably pull out the couch for you get you a, a sleeping bag or something i don't know i do charge but I, if i'll have my people talk to your people and we'll see if we can pull something off uh, okay, but dude, another thing i'd love to ask you before we wrap up uh, how critical are you of your own work can you can you look at your work is it harvey because i mean someone posted it and it was on twitter and it was like i think it was your director's commentary for the northman and it was like you were talking about shots and you were like, yeah, I don't feel so strongly about that shot. Maybe I could have done something better there. And it's fascinating to me how like a director like you can look at your own work, which I I mean, I adore all your films. And like, in my opinion, you truly are one of the greatest filmmakers of all time. And like, you can look at your work and criticize. It. And it's like, I, I hear this anecdote a lot, but Francis Ford Coppola on his director's commentary for The Godfather, he was pining over shots he couldn't use. He's being very self-critical. So it's like, if Francis Ford Coppola can't even like The Godfather, then what chance do any other filmmakers have of liking their own films? Are you critical of your own work? Is it hard for you to watch your own work? Yeah, I mean, if you're not critical of your work, then you don't grow. You, If you're complacent and, and just proud of everything, then you can't uh, grow. And, and And part of like the hunger of creating this work is to you know improve yeah um so so yeah i think it's i think it's i mean i think it's i mean i'm certainly proud of aspects of of all of my films but but yeah but if but 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 it's it's crucial to be critical yeah I mean, yeah, dude, I think you put it best there. And so, you know, my last couple of questions before I let you go. Uh, what advice would you have for anyone looking to become a filmmaker? Uh, watch as, as many films as you can, but don't just watch them, study them, uh, read as many books as you can, uh, you know, study art history, study photography, just learn everything you can, work harder than you ever uh, could could believe possible. And, um, you know, and then nurture relationships with people who have the same taste as you who want to be making films. Uh, you know, I mean, uh, I've been working with Jaron Blaschke and Louise Ford for like yeah. over 15 years or something. And when we met, you know, I was living in a breakfast nook, like with a mattress that folded up the sides. Jaron didn't have a home at all <laughs> you know and yeah and, you know and now we're all in the fog and Maybe now you have a home you have no, a home. <laughs> i actually still don't but uh, <laughs> yeah, i'm right. working on it i'm working yeah. on it you'll get one soon how hard can it be you know you, you have that cash money uh before we finish up is there any new project you can promote is there a release date or anything in nosferatu anything people no, no, it's all very tight lipped. More, maybe more tight lipped than it needs to be, but I can only do what I can do. <laughs> Dude, amazing! I can't wait to see that. Uh, any other projects you can promo? Anything people should go check out? Um, no, but uh, <laughs> um, I just saw the new horror movie, The Offering, the other night. It's oh not yeah, too not too bad. Have you gotten to see much films in twenty twenty two, or has this just been a busy year? Um, not as many as I never see as many as I'd like, and I also have yeah. like my own syllabus of like old and obscure movies that I'm always trying to work my way through. So, so dude, I hope you get some free time soon. Uh, before we finish up, I don't know if you are, but you are on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Is there anywhere people can go follow you? I, 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 I I'm, I don't do any social media. <laughs> Robert, you are a better man than I am. Anyway, thank you guys so much for watching. Uh, Robert, I'll talk to you a little bit off air. But everyone, uh, make sure to like and subscribe. And as always, if you have the means, please make sure to donate to the National Death Trend Society. Link in the description. But yeah, thank you guys so much for watching. Keep an eye on Robert's work. This has been my interview with one of my favorite filmmakers of all time. Robert, thank you so much for taking the time to come on, sir. Cheers. Have a good one.